Okay, let's try that again. Uh, ciao a tutti. Um, grazie per aver partecipato uh, alla mia discorso. That's as much Italian, uh, Italian that I can speak. Um, thank you for joining me for this talk this afternoon with the lo looming uh, weather that is coming up. I really appreciate that you made your way here to my talk. What am I going to talk about today is Google Cloud Spanner, a horizontally global distributed relational database. And I'm going to talk a little bit in more detail how everything works. But before that, I want to put a couple of words to my person in terms of like what my job at Google is. I'm a developer advocate at Google. And we understand our job as being a bi-directional interface, so to say, between developers that build on our products and the developers within Google that build the products for you. So please uh, feel free to reach out to me on Twitter or through GitHub if you have like constructive feedback, if you have some ideas what you want to do with Google Cloud Platform or certain products, and we're happy to be there for, for you to respond to you. Now, what am I going to cover today in this talk is I want to give a brief history about like, how Spanner was built within Google and why it was built. I'm going to go a little bit more in detail about like, what is the added feature set in terms of Cloud Spanner, like what are we adding to the version that we have internally. And then I will spend a fair amount on explaining the inner workings of Spanner and give a demo. Now, why did we build uh, Spanner? Let's go back about 12 years. And Google has been, at that point, running on top of a sharded MySQL. So we had a database which was sharded based on the customer ID. Our S business was running through it. And there are a lot of millions of dollars basically backed on this sharded MySQL system. Now, since we were growing really fast, we had to basically reshard that database multiple times. And the last time we reshard the days of that, that database, it took over two, two years to reshard that database. So clearly, this was not a solution that we could go forward in the terms of like scalability that we needed. So what did we really need from a database where lots of customers are basically betting their, their money on. So we had customers um, with budgets. We had our own uh, systems that needed basically transactional consistency as, as a backend. So we needed a database which scales horizontally, which supports asset transactions, and most importantly, that can support no downtime updates of uh, security updates and schema updates and things like that. Because every time we basically had to shut down our backend, it would be a loss of money for us and lots of our customers as well. So this was not acceptable. Also, because we were dealing with people's money, uh, eventually consistency was not acceptable for us either. So fast forward about 10, 12 years that we were running Cloud Spanner inside of Google, we made it now available for all of you to uh, basically use it on with your applications. But we added a couple of things which we think are really important for a cloud solution to offer that under the portfolio of Google Cloud Platform. So one of the very first thing is Google Cloud Spanner comes as a fully managed service. It is the same backend, the same uh, engineering, the same technology that we use internally for our Spanner. But you get it basically through your UI, fully managed, very easy to set up, and then within seconds available for you. It's still the same performance and global consistency that we have inside. Also, what is really important is we wanted to meet uh, people and developers where they are in terms of familiarity with interacting with relational databases. So Spanner supports the familiar SQL ANSI 2011 standard. It has tra traditional relational semantics and um, asset semantics. Also, Spanner supports an automatically synchronous replication. Um, for like regional and multi-regional setups. And it is battle tested within Google for more than five years. Now, for regional setups, we provide actually four nines of avail availability, which boils down to four minutes and 38 seconds, roughly, of unavailability that we accept for a regional setup. Later this year, we will support a multi-regional setup that can span the globe where you get five nines of availability uh, for that setup, which basically boils down to about 26 seconds per month in unavailability that we guarantee. 
Now, another thing which was really important for us was when we were working with our, our early access customers to help them integrate Cloud Spanner into their applications. So we were looking at like, OK, like how we, can we make it as easy as possible to adapt Cloud Spanner? One I already mentioned was SQL, that we support SQL, and that we want support one SQL standard across our product portfolio. So there has been, in the past, multiple SQL dialects. We now switch to uh, SQL ANSI 2011 across our, our portfolio. So BigQuery, as also Spanner, supports ANSI 11, uh, 2011. Um, for all of our data that is uh, stored in, in Spanner, it is encrypted at rest and in flight. And we added things like audit locking and integration of our IAM, so our in the identity and access management, so that you can control uh, access to data within Spanner. With the launch, we provide also the client libraries in four languages, and we are working hard on more languages to, to add to these. So currently, we have Java, Go, Python, and Node.js as the languages that you can use today out of the box. We also have a REST API and a gRPC step if you want to build your own client libraries in a different language. And we provide a read-only GDPC driver to integrate with things like BI tools for, uh, from partners and things like that. So how does Spanner compare to like a traditional database or a non-SQL scalable database? If you look at Spanner in one sentence, I would describe it as you get a relation, like a database with the semantics of a relational database with the scalability of a, of a NoSQL database. So what does that mean? Spanner provides you things like a strong schema, strong, strong type schema, uh, provides you SQL, uh, which a lot of you probably are familiar with. It provides you strong consistency. And the way that Spanner works behind the scenes adds also things uh, like high availability and sc horizontal scalability. All the data is automatically replicated to read replicas. And also, um, I will go into more detail in terms of the architecture, like how we, we achieve the high availability and the horizontal scalability. Now, some might like, say, like, OK, like, some, many of these things I can get from a traditional relational database as well. So yes, but uh, many scenarios, if you look at the scalability, for instance, you look at a scenario where you, for instance, have a, My, a sharded MySQL or sharded Postgres. Now, if you want to get scalability there, there are certain things that you can do. For once, you can, for instance, add some read replicas to offload some workload from your master, and by that, scale, scale more for your writes on your master. But you basically have to hope that your cloud provider or your machine uh, producer gives you a bigger machine as your system is growing, as your business is growing. So you kind of run out of headspace eventually at some point, but like in the terms of the amount of data that you can manage with a traditional relational database or the amount of reads and writes that you can handle with that system. Now, also, oftentimes, if you go into the sharded uh, world of uh, MySQL or Postgres, you lose a lot of the qualities of the underlying database system and a lot of the semantics you have to put up into your business logic, which makes the whole system very complex. So now with Spanner, you basically can put this logic back into the database, and you don't have to care in your application layer about it. Now, comparing to a non-SQL database, you basically don't have these things where you have tweakable consistency, where you might have to deal with eventual consistency uh, for like a Cassandra or MongoDB or things like that. So you basically have given the highest standard of serializability with Spanner, external serializability. And there's no like, way around it. That's basically what you get and you will always have. Now, if we look at the typical workloads where uh, Spanner is used, I want to emphasize on two areas where Spanner is really strong. One is, I mentioned, no downtime uh, schema and security updates behind uh, the scenes, basically, for Spanner, which makes Spanner a very high available system. So, if you have a system which is mission critical, where you cannot accept any downtime, Spanner, even if you have not a lot of data, Spanner is your, your choice. That's something where you should look into. Another thing is in terms of scalability for read writes and data size. 
So if you want to scale horizontally for your reads and writes uh, in transactions, Scanner, Spanner is again uh, a very good solution for, for this. You won't get the very low latency query times you might get with some of the vertical scalable solutions. But in the end, you're, if you design your database well from, the que uh, from a schema and query standpoint, you can basically, with adding nodes, scale very well uh, horizontally, and you don't get the hockey, hockey stick at the end if you get out of um, capacity on your nodes. So things where we see a lot of usage for these kinds of workloads is, for instance, like financial system, inventory management, where you need kind of like a global consistent uh, database, and things where you need a lot of reads and writes. For a matter of fact, uh, if we look at the global data plane, Google Cloud Platform, everything in terms of the management of resources and APIs and uh, virtual machines is backed by Spanner as a global data plane. Another use case that we see and uh, that you can use Spanner for since it's scalable in terms of the size of data it can handle is uh, database consolidation. So instead of running your daily ATL jobs of like uh, extracting them data from like a NoSQL solution and then extracting some account data from, from your relational database and then running some analytics on that, you can basically think of putting all this data into one database and without the hassle of having ETLs everywhere. So with that, I want to look into like how does Spanner actually achieve these things that I just claimed. I claimed horizontal scalability. I, I claimed that it can grow in database size up to terabytes and petabytes. Uh, and I claimed that it can handle a lot of like read and write loads. So the way that Spanner is doing this is a separation of compute versus storage. So if you look here. Uh, this is an example of a regional setup. So I have a regional instance. I create that regional instance in one of my preferred uh, regions. And when I start like, and buy three nodes, I get actually behind the scenes nine nodes. So all the three nodes that I buy are replicated three times in three zones. Now in each of the zones, I have storage, basically. So the storage is replicated as well. Now, if we look at the terminology in terms of like, what are the visible um, items for a Spanner database and instance from a client side, and what, are, what is behind the scenes to enable the horizontal scalability. We start with an instance that we just saw. So you basically set up your regional instance that defines how many nodes you have, how many, uh, where this regional instance lives, or later uh, in this year, we have a multi-regional instance. So you can decide where your multi-regional instance lives. In each of these instances, you can create multiple databases, up to 100 databases. And then in each database, you uh, create tables, as we are familiar with from a MySQL database, for instance. Now, these tables are behind the scenes. We split these tables by key ranges. And these splits are done based on the primary key and by range. Now, what enables this splitting? The splitting enables us to horizontal scale. So how do we do this? Basically, the compute resources that we have available in our regional instance are responsible for multiple splits. So the splits are basically parts of data in your database. Now, basically, a split is part of your table. Now, we see that. In all of these regions, we basically have a compute node or compute resource which is responsible for split one here in this example. And we have a Paxos group formed by these three compute nodes that are responsible for the split one. Now we use Paxos to, to select a leader in this group. And now once we have this leader, we can make sure that only one compute node is responsible for and gating basically writes write transaction on that data piece. By that, we can make sure that we have global consistency, because there's never two leaders for a data piece. Now, you could imagine, like, in a distributed world, this would incur a lot of communication to make sure that we have, at most, one responsible compute node uh, for a data piece. The way that we remove some of this communication overhead is with an innovation that we specifically did for, for Spanner. And it is called true time. Now, what is true time? Imagine you're sitting next to your neighbor and you're trying to synchronize your watches. 
Now you go off and meet again in a couple of hours. You have been uh, exposed to different temperatures, different iso uh, isospheric rays and things like that. Your, your clocks will drift away from each other. So it's really hard actually to synchronize clocks even in a small vicinity of a room. Now think of synchronizing clocks globally across data centers. Now TrueTime actually achieves that by a very smart technology and uh, semantic way. What TrueTime does is actually we use GPS to synchronize our data centers clockwise, and we use atomic clocks in these data centers to basically keep a like, very accurate time. Now still, we cannot use just a single timestamp to make sure that this timestamp is the exact timestamp everywhere in the world. We have to quantify a interval, which basically gives us the uncertainty of this timestamp. What does that mean? A lot of words. It basically means we get with true time a lower bound and an upper bound of a timestamp. The lower bound of the timestamp tells us that this timestamp has passed everywhere in the world. The upper bound of that interval gives us a timestamp which tells us this timestamp definitely hasn't passed anywhere in the world. Now, with these two timestamps, we can make sure that there's only one leader, exactly one leader for a database. And by that, we get the, the external serializability for our transactions that we provide. Now, in terms of like the, the interval, how long is that roughly? In our paper, we published that it's in the single digit milliseconds um, interval in terms of like the lower bound and the upper bound. Now, what happens if, for instance, in my data center, all atomic clocks fail and all GPS fails? What happens in this case is that we actually go to a different data center to get these true time, and we will calculate in the travel time of the data, basically from our data center to the next data center. Now, with that, the interval basically widens, and the database slows down, but the database doesn't stop. So that is really important, the database, even in the case that we lose atomic clocks or we lose GPS in a data center, the database will continue working and will continue working in a con very consistent, uh, in a global consistent way. So let's demonstrate that on, on a query. Here in this example, I select from my event table uh, all the events that have the name next Milan. So in a consistent read scenario, I basically send a request from my client, and in this case, it comes in through my read replica. And the read replica will go to the leader for that data piece in my Paxos group and will ask, like, hey, do I have the latest data? Basically sends a timestamp of the data that the replay, read replica already has. Now the leader will respond, yes, you have the latest data, and the data will be served from my read replica. In the case that the read replica doesn't have the, uh, the uh, most recent data. The leader will just respond, no, you don't have the data, just wait till that timestamp. And once you see that timestamp, you can respond the data. The reason is that the data is already in flight when this question is basically asked, so we don't need to send the data back um, even if the read replica doesn't have the latest data. So we basically just wait out that time. We basically wait to that uh, timestamp, our upper, upper bound timestamp in true time, wait out that time uh, that we got from the leader, and once we have that timestamp and we have the data, we can, we can basically uh, respond. Now, we also support something called stale or inconsistent reads, time-bounded reads. When are these useful? Imagine you have a multi-regional setup, and this is globally distributed between the US, Europe, and, and Asia. Now, time-bounded queries gives you the possibility to basically read data that is a little bit older in a way that you say, okay, I accept data that is up to 15 seconds old. Now, in that case, the read replica can check, do I have data that is at most 15 seconds old? And if that is the case, it basically can respond immediately without uh, consulting the leader of that data piece, which could go across the, uh, the ocean in, in some cases to, to check if that data is actually the most recent one. Now, what happens in the read-write transaction? In a read-write transaction, when I start that transaction, 
and I basically do within this read-write transaction context, I do a query. I'm directly routed to the leader of that Paxos group, of that for which is responsible for that data piece. Now the leader will acquire logs, return the results, I do some modification on that, and then I'm sending basically the modifications to the leader, and the leader will send out the modification to the group, the Paxos group. Once the leader receives a majority of acknowledgments from all the participants in that group, and considers this transaction committed, will basically uh, release the logs and return to the client a success of that transaction. If you look at the data layout which uh, Spanner supports, I mentioned that it supports traditional SQL, ANSI SQL in the same way as like other databases. So we also have the relational models that you're familiar with, with uh, strongly typed schemas, relational schemas. You see here, uh, creating a singles table and an album table with an ID and some single name and an album ID. Now, if you look at like database like MySQL, you have things like foreign key constraints or referential inte integrity that you can get through that. We don't support that in the distributed system, um, but we have something which is basically a foreign key constraint minus minus, and that is called interleaved tables. What are interleaved tables? Now, interleaved tables give you co-located uh, data locality in the sense of here, I have my singers table and I have my album table, and I interleave that album table into my singers table. Now, all this data is basically put in one split that I talked about, which is like a part of that table. It, it will be put all in one split per row. So you have the, the Beatles row here in the example, and every album for the Beatles will be living in the same split as the row the, where the Beatles lives in. And that gives you kind of like a pre-join in terms of like that joins can be answered very quickly from one compute node that is uh, controlling and responsible for that split. So if we do this for our data model that we have just seen, we basically just add an interleaved in, and we have to make sure that the interleaved table uh, shares the primary keys of the, the outer table, and then we can basically interleave the table. Also, what is really important here is that we support no downtime schema updates. So you can add columns, you can change um, like size attributes of columns, so you can go from a string 20 to a string 50, things like that. All these schema updates run in actually in a transaction. So there are a couple of things that you have to be aware of when you migrate from a traditional MySQL database on Postgres or any of the major bigger database vendors to Cloud Spanner to uh, keep the scalability. Now, one of the things is that like are heavily used or that many times are used in a traditional database are things like auto increment ID as a primary key. Now, this is actually poison for for Spanner in terms of the of of the horizontal scalability, and I will get into a uh, little bit more detail about that. So don't use any monitoring increasing or decreasing primary keys. Don't use any timestamps for as primary keys in your, in your schema. Also be careful in terms of like how much you use interleaving. I mentioned all of this lives basically in the split of the parent table, which means like if you interleave like huge tables into one row of your parent table, you also run out of capacity in terms of resources for that node that is handling that uh, split. So if we look at like using, for instance, timestamps for primary key, what, would, what you would end up with is hotspotting one of your compute nodes in managing that data. So imagine you're loading your data beta, database and you're putting the timestamp as, as the primary key. What what you end up with is that all your new data that you load into the database ends in the last split of your table, and the last split is handled by one, one uh, computer source. Now, to avoid this, you can do things like using UIDs uh, version 4, or you're using like sharding, uh, sharding IDs. So what does that look like? If you look, and everything is also um, on our 
documentation, you find more detailed explanation about how you can optimize your schemas and your workloads uh, to not bottleneck on, on, on hotspot on certain things. Now, if you, for instance, use a sharding ID, what it will look like is we now prefix our, our primary key with a sharding ID, and by that, we enable to spread out the workload across multiple compute resources, as you can see here. With this, I want to go in a little demo. So we already switched. Perfect. Um, so your first, first stop point, if you want to learn more about Cloud Spanner and if you want to get uh, your hands on uh, with Spanner, is cloud.google.com uh, cloud slash spanner, where you find a multitude of resources around documentation, how to use it, but also um, things like case studies, as you can see down here. We have a case study with Quizlet that moved and migrated from uh, sharded MySQL to Spanner and does a lot of like analytics around like what did we have to change in our applications to do this migration. I'm also asked like quite a couple times today already like does Spanner defeat the cap theorem? Spanner does not defeat the cap theorem and you can read in detail around uh, a take of the inventor of the cap theorem, Eric Brewer, uh, take on that in terms of like in, in contrast to Spanner. But basically what I can say is Spanner is a CP system, but the infrastructure that supports Spanner within Google has not failed us in the way that we did not have a network partition so far with our internal Spanner system. So the strong infrastructure that we have within Google basically gives us the reliability and this like a very unlikely scenario of a partitioning where we would in that case result to a consistent system and would become unavailable. Now for a regional setup we basically give an SLA for a four nines and for a multi-regional setup we give an SLA of five nines of availability for, for this. Now if you want to get started with a spanner the first thing that you do is create your instance. And that couldn't be easier than doing a spanner playground, giving it a name. It automatically gives you an instance ID. You choose one of the four regions that we currently support, which is basically in Asia, uh, East and Northeast, so Taiwan and Japan, and also Europe in Belgium and US in Iowa. So for this example, I will choose Europe. You choose the amount of nodes that you want to start with. You click Create, and within seconds, you have an error. Um, huh. All right. Let's see if I have enough quota to have at least one node. Awesome. OK. So I didn't have enough quota for 10 nodes, but I have at least uh, enough quota for one node here. So now you have your instance, and you basically can start creating your database. So you can choose a normal DDL, um, SQL DDL, or you can use our editor here in the console to create your table. Now for the demo purpose, I use this uh, UI editor. I'm adding some information, primary key, selecting my age as a primary key, and I create this table. And within like a couple of clicks, I have a database where I can run queries against, and I can also check the, the schema. Now, I mentioned online updates, so I can, for instance, add another column, and I forgot the name of the singer. I want to give it a string, and I, let's say like 100 characters should be enough. I can save this, and if I reload this page, you can see here that we instantly see that this schema update is in progress. Now, this is done in a transaction. So you basically, at a specific timestamp, you will have that new schema available, and you can accommodate that in your, in your uh, application. Now, if you have joined the keynote this morning, you, you might have seen or are familiar with this schema. So I built a ticket broker system, so to say, where I have a ticket database where I'm selling tickets uh, all around the world. And what's really important in this case is that I sell each ticket only once. I also wanted to have a system which is as, as realistic as possible. So in this database, we basically have an event table, which is all our events that are happening around the world. 
and we have different seating categories and venues that these events are happening in. So you can think of like a VIP seating, uh, premium seating, general seating. And then once this event is actually happening, I attach also some prices to these categories. So we have a ticket category table. And at the end, we also have uh, for each of these tickets that are available in our system, we have a ticket in our ticket table. So for the demo database that we use today in our, in our uh, keynote demo, we have actually about 2 billion rows, 2 billion tickets available in the database. Now, this database runs right now um, live. And in this query, I want to select all the events that are happening from now till uh, tomorrow evening, tomorrow night. So I want to see like, what events are still happening in Italy and what are the available seats. Now, when I run this query, it will take a while. Um, and it will give me a result of like all the events that I have and all the tickets that are available. And as you can see, the seats available is a little lower than the total seats are available. So this database is actually live running right now. What you can do as well is you can get an explanation, a query plan of the query that you just executed. So what you see here is, for instance, the CPU time that was uh, uh, needed. You see the, the rows that was returned for this query. And you see the, the rows that were scanned. Now I'm, I'm a bit familiar with this query because I designed it. And I see like there's a lot of rows scanned here. And I think that's way too many. And if I go to, through my query plan, I can see that I'm doing a table scan on my event table. Now, you might have seen it. You might have missed it. In my query, I actually had a filter based on a timing. And I should be, should be able to do something smarter than a table scan on my event table. For a matter of fact, if we look at the event table on the left side, we are seeing that I have some, some indexes defined in my table. So I talked about extensions, SQL ANSI 2011 with extensions. So one of the things that you can do, um, which you can do also like for many other databases, is to give the compiler, the query compiler and optimizer, a hint. So in this case, I want to force an index. And I have event by date here as my index and say, OK, please use this index right now. And as you can see, the query got a lot faster. And if we go into the explanation, I now down to 4,000 rows scanned instead of 400,000 uh, rows. So you have the possibility to also use the extension that we provide to improve uh, your queries and optimize your queries. Now, if you want to get started with Cloud Spanner, one of the ways that you can get started with is our Java client library. And I'm going to walk through a, a small example here for, for our um, Java client library. In this case, I'm using um, a demo database. And the first thing that I have to do is basically get some credentials and authentication against my database. If you run that locally with uh, our G Cloud SDK set up, you basically live in the context, the authentication context of, of your G Cloud uh, CLI. So I'm basically just getting these uh, application default credentials. And the next thing that I'm doing is setting the instance ID that I need and the database ID that I want to talk to. Now, my first example that I want to do here is I want to do a read-only transaction. So I get a transaction context, and I execute a query. Now, this query, what it does, it basically selects all the multi-events that are happening uh, today to, to tomorrow. So you have some uh, parameter placeholders, which I'm binding in, in my, um, in my uh, query down here, in my statement builder. Now, the last thing, as you can see, I'm already executing the query there. The last thing that I want to do is already um, going through my Result set. So I'm going through uh, iterate basically through my result set that I'm getting, and I'm execute running result as fetching the results. So here I can do a get string, and I can use either positional arguments or I can use the uh, column name in my example. So I'm using the positional because I'm lazy, and then I'm executing that, and as I can see, 
uh, within, hopefully, if I didn't do any mistakes, I will see some events coming up down here, as you can see. So I have all my multi-events that are happening from today to tomorrow. Now I talked about uh, time-bounded um, queries. So one thing that I can do in my read-only transactions, I can actually add uh, timestamp bound, which uh, sets the maximal staleness that allow for a query. So I have that uh, added this here, and if I execute that again or run this again, it goes against the read replica and can directly serve that data from the read replica without basically consulting the leader of the Paxos group. The next thing that I want to show is the, how the write looks like. So if I have a write-only transaction, I basically work with mutations. Now, what is a mutation? A mutation is basically any changes in my tables, and you have to look at mutations as like on cell level. So in transaction, we support up to 20,000 mutations. If you have a table with five columns, and you load one row into this, uh, in this table, you have five mutations. If you have to find an index on that table with another two columns, and you insert one row, you basically have seven mutations. Now here in this case, I basically add an account in my table, and uh, I run that, and if we go back to my database, I go my demo instance, and go to my accounts and go on preview, we see that I have inserted here uh, an account. Now, the next thing, if you want to do a read-write transaction, you basically obtain a transaction runner that we can see here. So basically, we, we execute uh, or we run a read-write transaction. And to that read-write transaction, we provide a transaction callable from a transaction runner. So basically, it's a function that you give to that run function. And in this run function, you, you define what you want to do in terms of reading and uh, updating your data. So in this case, I'm selecting my account, I'm updating the name of my account, and then I'm adding these mutations to my transaction and run this transaction. Now, why are we doing this is in a, in a in transaction runnable? The reason is that our client libraries do automatic retries of transactions if they fail. So uh, this uh, it makes it easier for us to basically do the recovery uh, from failed transactions and, and rerun them again. So now if I go to my database and check the preview, again, you see that I updated my name. All right, with this, I'm going back to the slides. So the last thing that I want to talk about for, from the slides, once we switch, is um, the, in terms of like how does Spanner fit into the storage portfolio that we have on our cloud platform. So I want to just mention a couple of things here. Um, when, when do you use Spanner? Just wanted to reiterate, there are two major use cases for Spanner. If you need a high rateable system, which scales horizontally for, um, for a transactional workload in reads and writes, Spanner is your way to go. If, even if you have a low amount of data, you can use it. Also, if you have a lot of data that you want to scale basically horizontally, again, that is a way to go for Spanner. We have a lot of other options under the Google Cloud Platform portfolio. If you come from a MySQL or Postgres world, we have a managed service called Cloud SQL which you can move to basically as a lift and shift if you want to. If you are looking at a more like no SQL world where you like have data that is document based, you're looking at cloud data store or if you have key value based um, workloads which need like very low latencies for reads and writes and uh, high scalability, you look at cloud big table. If you have things like blob stores like videos, photos, things like that or any kind of files, you look into the cloud storage world. And if you uh, want to do data analytics over relational data, so basically data warehouse um, applications or scenarios, you look into BigQuery, which is our uh, distributed and very scalable data warehouse for relational um, data. With this, thank you very much. And uh, I hope you enjoyed the session. Thank you.